four days before. The no confidence, so I'll go through and track the, the steps went through, just to remind you what a long and difficult, tiring and frustrating road we've gone through based on the Granger-led administration's refusal to hold elections as required by the Constitution and in defiance of the Constitution, and of course with the collaboration of GCOM for months and months and months. And so the no confidence motion succeeds on the night, succeeded on the night of December 21st, 2018. The government is defeated, and according to the Constitution, elections must be held within three months. President Granger and the Prime Minister accept defeat within 24 hours and pledge elections will be held in accordance with the Constitution. So this is immediately after December 21st, before the year ends. GCOM announces that it's holding meetings to prepare for elections. Following Christmas 2018, Nigel Hughes goes public on a new mathematical calculation that 34 of 65 is the majority required and not 33 of 65. Well, of course, you know that had everyone's mathematics in a spin. The Attorney General and Minister of Legal Affairs announced that the government will call on the Speaker to review his decision that 34 is the majority of 65 and not 34, 33. On January 3rd, 2019, the National Assembly is convened and the Speaker declines to reverse his decision. GCOM halts at that point all preparations for elections. It seems if GCOM goes into some kind of somnambulism, uh, somnambulistic trance from that period on. The government decides to approach the Chief Justice Rox Roxanne Wilshire George to declare the no confidence motion and the no confident vote null and void, based on the fact that it requires 34 of 65 according to the government, and that dual citizens uh, should not be in parliament, and therefore their votes don't count. January 31st, 2019, the Chief Justice upholds the Constitution and rules that the President Cabinet should stood resigned, and that elections must be held within three months of the no confidence motion or an extension with two thirds of all major elected parliamentarians supporting an extension. The government then decides to appeal the Chief Justice decision. So this is all the end of January going into early February. On March the 9th, the opposition leader proposes to the president that the PPP would be willing to accept an extension of the date for elections on or before April 30th when the life of the president voters list expires. As you know, we've discussed this on this program. Silence was the response. Granger announces at, a, at an address to the nation that he must be advised by GCOM as to the date it will be ready. The GCOM chairman, Patterson, writes the president days before March the 21st, 2019, stating that GCOM needs additional resources, that is funds, and it could be ready by the end of November 2019. On March 21st, this is the date that elections were due three months from December 21st. There is no election, no announcement of a date of election, no extension is uh, proposed by the government. And so at that point, the Granger-led government is illegal. On March 22nd, the Court of Appeal rules that the no confidence motion is valid but that 34 votes of the 65 MPs are required to pass the no-confidence motion. So the Court of Appeal overturns the Chief Justice ruling. In early April, the PPP and the parliamentary opposition file an appeal with the Caribbean Court of Justice, our apex court for Guyana. A private individual, Christopher Ram, also files an appeal to, um, to the ruling of the Court of Appeal. On May 23, 2019, the National Assembly voted additional billions of dollars for GCOM. So GCOM, with its 2019 allocation and the additional money granted in May 2019, brings the amount of money to approximately $9 billion that GCOM has to hold elections in Guyana. On June 18, 2019, the CCJ ruled on a case brought by the PVP before the no-confidence motion with regards to the violation of the Constitution by the President in his unilateral appointment of the Chairman of GCOM. The CCG stated that the unilateral appointment was flawed and the President acted in breach of the Constitution. 
On the same date, on a separate matter, June 18, 2019, the judiciary, that is the Caribbean Court of Justice, affirmed the validity of the no confidence motion and ruled as follows, that Article 106 of the Constitution immediately became engaged on December 21st, 2018. The President and Cabinet stood resigned. Elections ought to have been held since March the 21st, 2019. That the March 21st, 2019 deadline was paused due to the approaches to the, to the judiciary, but this pause was now lifted and elections had to be held in accordance with the Constitution within three months. The government and the Guyana Elections Commission must honor the provisions of the Constitution with integrity. And the government functions in a, a caretaker or interim capacity leading up to elections. And in the ruling, the court went, went into detail of what, what that meant. On July the 12th, 2019, the Caribbean Court of Justice, in its consequential order, stated it was not his duty to pronounce on an election date, since the timeline in the Constitution is clearly laid out. Elections were overdue. <clears throat> Following the, the ruling of the Caribbean Court of Justice, the President addresses the nation and refers to the necessity for the house to house registration being required to have credible elections, based on his claim that there are 200,000 incorrect entries, and he cannot name a date until GCOM says it is ready and that the National House to House Registration exercise is completed. Again in July, GCOM commences the House to House Registration in accordance with the views of the government-appointed commissioners, thus delaying elections. The, re the PPPC refuses to participate in the House to House exercise as it is a means to delay elections to March 2020. We also feel very strongly that the House to House exercise was fraught with a sinister agenda. The PPP approaches the court following the commencement of the House to House exercise, approaches the court to stop the House to House registration exercise. The government and GCOM defend the House to House exercise. On July 26, the new chairman, Madam Retired Justice Claudette Singh, appointed by Granger in accordance with the Caribbean Court of Justice orders and the Constitution, following consultation with the leader of the opposition as required. In August, the Chief Justice rules that the House to House exercise is legal, but the scrapping of the National Registration Database cannot is not legal and therefore cannot be done. But in the light of the no confidence vote, the Constitution requires elections which are overdue. That the electoral laws, she continues that the electoral laws provide for other means of verifying the list, such as claims and objections. And the Constitution identifies only certain reasons for disqualifying a voter. And res residency is not a requirement of the Constitution or the electoral laws of Ghana. And that she further says that no one who, are, who is eligible to vote is to be disenfranchised. In August, following the Chief Justice ruling, the Chicom of Jir the Chicom Jir chairperson unilaterally decides to abort the House to House registration exercise. <clears throat> In August, too, the chairman of Gcom assures the leader opposition and chairman of the PNC, Walder Lawrence, and the APNU AFC that elections will be held before the end of 2019. The PPPC, PPPC holds peaceful protests across the country in every region, calling for a date for elections to be announced before or on September the 18th, 2019, which will bring the three months a deadline from July, June 12th, sorry, from June 18th. On September 18th, no date is announced by the now illegal President Granger. On September 19th, the chairman of GCOM writes to the illegal president informing him that GCOM will be ready to hold elections by the end of February 2020. This caused great consternation as she had publicly assured 
the main two main political parties, the People's Progressive Party Civic and the APNO AFC, that elections, assure them elections will be a long before the end of 2019. On September 19th, following the announcement by, by the, um, following the letter and the announcement by the chairperson of GCOM that GCOM would be ready to hold elections um, by the end of February 2020. On September 19th, the United States of America Ambassador to Guyana, the United Kingdom High Commissioner for Guyana, and the European Union Ambassador to Guyana issued a joint statement. And I want to just reiterate the, that statement. The United States, United Kingdom, and the European Union re deeply regret that by surpassing September 18th, the government is currently in breach of the Constitution following its failure to adhere to the decisions of the Caribbean Court of Justice on the 18th of June and its subsequent orders. On September 19th, 2019, this is the full, full thing what they said. I'm oh, sorry, I'll continue reading what they said. The situation comes at a great cost to the people of Guyana. The prevailing political uncertainty undermines Guyana's institutions, compromises economic opportunities, and delays development across all areas, including infrastructure, education, health, and social services. It also hinders our ability, that is US, Britain, UK, and the European Union, to support Guyana's development needs. This is bare language to say that they can hold up funds allocated to Ghana. It continues, we therefore call upon the president to set an elections date immediately in full compliance with Ghana's constitution. This was followed with a statement from the Commonwealth Secretary General, the Right Honorable Patricia Scotland QC on September the 23rd. Her statement says, the Commonwealth Secretary General urges the President of Guyana and all relevant stakeholders and institutions to restore, note the word restore, constitutional ruling Guyana, because if you're restoring, it means it's not there, right? Restore constitutional ruling Guyana by immediately setting an early election date in consonance with its constitution, enabling elections to be held without further delay. The Secretary General has taken note of the 18 June 2019 ruling of the Caribbean Court of Justice and its consequential orders of July 12th. The CCJ's ruling was clear that the Guyana Constitution sets out certain requirements for the time of election after the valid passing of a no confidence motion. The rule of law and constitutional governance are fundamental values to which Guyana has subscribed. In this regard, and in accordance with the ruling of the Caribbean Court of Justice, a general election in Guyana is now constitutionally overdue. Note the words, constitutionally overdue. A general election should be held in accordance with the unambiguous constitution imperative to do so. The Secretary General has spoken with the Chair of the Guyana Elections Commission and discussed Commonwealth support to GCOM. On September 28, 2019, the Organization of American States, which represents all the countries that are in the Western Hemisphere, ferric part of the, the Earth, planet Earth, that is coming from Canada all the way down to Argentina at the bottom. The OAS General Secretariat underlines the importance to the people of Ghana of leaving behind the period of political uncertainty as soon as possible. The OAS General Secretary looks forward to the issuance of the proclamation required by Ghana's constitution to firmly establish the date for the elections. So that's the 18th, 19th, 28th. The Commonwealth, following all that, the Commonwealth, the United Nations, and the Canadian government offer the support of technical experts to the chairperson of the Guyana Elections Commission to assist in preparing for elections to ensure that these elections meet the standards of transparency, credibility, and integrity required of all democracies, as stated by the Organization of American States. The Commonwealth, the European Union, and the Carter Center express an interest in sending observer missions to Guyana for the March 2nd, 2019 general and regional elections. This is, again, we're talking about September. Under international pressure, on October 1st, the illegal president issues a proclamation 
naming the date for elections as March the 2nd, 2020. The PNC appointed commissioners repeatedly claim over the year, over the whole year of 2019, that there are over 20, 25, and 30,000 national ID cards uncollected, more than 20,000, and even as much as 35,000 dead. So you're talking about 65,000 people they want to remove from the list. On October 1st, GCOM commences the claims and objection period that goes to November 4th for claims and November 10th for objections. And this comes after two orders issued by Law and Field that contradict the decisions of the chairperson, Justice Claudette Singh, and twice they have to be corrected before October 1st. GCOM sends the 307,000 names from the house to house exercise, the aborted house to house exercise, to be cross matched, that is, the fingerprints are cross matched uh, with the national registration, uh, a register of registrants database of GCOM to a company called Jumalto in Jamaica that will do the scanning and the cross matching of the fingerprints. On November 4th, the claims period ends. GCOM, which has been dilly-dallying for over two months with regards to what to do with the names of persons registered in the House to House, and the government appointed commissioners advocating for the merging of the list from the House to House with the names of the PLE and the names from the claims objection exercise. In this period, just before the claims objection, the claims period ends, GCOM publishes the names of the persons on the House to House list. The PPC proceeds to verify and finds many problems, duplicates, persons unknown of, never heard of before, and condemns any, any attempt to merge the two set of lists as a recipe for disaster, remembering that the house to house list was not verified, did not go through a process of verification with the presence of scrutinists from the People's Progressive Party or any other party other than APNO AFC. On November 6, the, the Chief Elections Officer, Lewinfield, issues an order that people have to collect their national ID cards as of November 27th, or they would be placed on a supplementary list to the official list of electors and have to provide additional proof of identity when they go to vote. GCOM then publishes the breakdown by region for uncollected ID cards, totaling 18,000 the majority in Region 4 and Georgetown. The, and so this deadline, however, has been subsequently extended, but there is no date as far as I know that's been given for when it will be concluded. The People's Progressive Party protests this as illegal, as there can be no supplementary list to the official list of electors. The Chief Justice ruling on August 14th is repeated by the media, opinion makers, and the People's Progressive Party Civic in response to this order of the GCOM. Paragraph 161 of the Chief Justice ruling says, GCOM would have no legal authority to remove or deregister such persons who are otherwise qualified unless such registration can be canceled. These persons may have to return to their districts to vote, but their names cannot ipso facto be removed from the register of registrants which removal would then disqualify them from and deprive them of their right to vote. To do so would be unconstitutional and therefore illegal. On November 10th and 11th, on the eve of the conclusion of the objection period, the APNU lodges over 14,000 objections to eligible voters. This is reminiscent of their attempt to do the same thing in 2001 to remove 20,000 voters. This massive attempt to disenfranchise thousands of legitimate voters of the People's Progressive Party mainly in Regions 5, 9, which the PEP won, and Regions 7 and 10, one village, was roundly defeated by the PPC machinery. November 27, GCOM again delayed making a decision on the use of the House to House data base, or sorry, the registrants that they collect in the House to House period until such times as certain anomalies are resolved. Funny enough, on the same day, same period, the Guyana Elections Commissioner Vincent Alexander 
finally admits that whether persons have identification cards to vote or not is not the issue. Initially, GCOM, led by Alexander and Corbyn, had announced that approximately 10 to 20,000 persons who did not collect ID cards over the past few years would be prevented from voting. After much criticism, the People's Progressive Party and national stakeholders, GCOM changed its decision in favor of those persons being allowed to vote. However, the caveat for GCOM was to place them on a separate list of the OLE with no verific verification. Maybe it is possible. What one, one has to ask is what made Alexander change his mouth? Maybe observe the largest portion of uncollected national ID cards is from Region 4 and Georgetown. Maybe Alexander and the PNC in their myopic and vindict vindictive plan to remove legitimate supporters of the People's Progressive Party Civic may also by this act recognize that but may also recognize by this action the impact on the supporters who had not collected their cards either. On November 28th, Carter Center is accredited to observe the 2020 elections by the government. On November 2nd, 2019, the date people anticipated that the illegitimate president would dissolve the National Assembly and the 10 RDCs in keeping with custom and practice of three months before the elections and the Constitution, which says within three months. However, of course, no date is issued, no proclamation is issued. The illegal president, in response to the media, which cornered him at a graduation exercise on December 14th, stated that there was no requirement for him to dissolve the National Assembly and the 10 RDCs, and he would be advised by cabinet and the National Assembly would not be dissolved in case GCOM needed more funds. Well, something is wrong with this gentleman because the constitution is very clear that it is the president by proclamation who issues one, the date for elections, and two, the dissolution of the National Assembly and the 10 RDCs. Funny enough, when GCOM was asked, do they need more funds? GCOM responds that it has sufficient funds as the aborted and is repeated today by law and feel as printed in the pop media, that as they didn't use all the money for the house to house, that they will have more than sufficient funds. In the 2015 elections, by the way, cost less than $4 billion. GCOM has over $9 billion. Also in early December, the European Union, Commonwealth, are also accredited to observe the elections by the government. Jamalto, the company that has been cross-matching the list, and doing it in two tranches. One set they sent, and then they said uh, GCOM sent a second set. Gimalto Gim reports to GCOM its findings. This is in early December. GCOM discovers that both tranches of house house data have been returned by Gimalto, and they appear to indicate that there are about 60,000 total new registrants. This unusually high figure prompted the secretary, that is GCOM secretary, to conduct its own assessment of the cross-match data. Opposition appointed Commissioner Gunraj and the Chief Elections Officer Keith Loinfield indicated to the Commission that the Secretary had found about 17,000 of those supposedly new registrants already on the National Register of Registrants database. So this becomes very difficult. How come Jamalto found this large number of people that their the cross-matching couldn't take place was that the, the, the um, fingerprints were unreadable by the scanners mm -hmm. or is it that the database does not have these people? Something strange was happening. On December 13, the political parties submit their symbols to GCOM. On December 14, GCOM publishes this of 20,000 not found names on the National Registrar of Registrants database after Jamalto cannot match over 30,000 names from the House House list. And these are sent for the PPP to verify without GCOM participation. 
In fact, the instructions are that GCOM would have nothing to do with this exercise. This was solely giving the list to the PUP, and the PUP had to go around and check these 20,000 odd names. However, two days later, on December 16th, GCOM changed its decision and decides to verify the house to house list with party scrutineers and the GCOM staff mobilized starting today, Thursday, December 19th, and Friday, tomorrow, 20th, in some hinterland areas. The number of 20,000, which was first mooted by GCOM, has been reduced to almost uh, 17,000, it's 16,000 plus. As GCOM claims, they have found approximately 4,000 duplicates on the list that Jamalto said that it had, could not find. This exercise I will start today will last until Sunday. That is, until Sunday, the GCOM with the scrutinizers from the political parties will be going out house to house to find these people on the list that the database of GCOM has no record of. And so that starts today. And the, uh, we have been given short notice. I think it's uh, we, it's about 24 to 48 hours we've been given to provide scrutineers for across the country in every GCOM office. On December 18th, the GCOM holds a second press conference where the chair asserts that one needs an ID card to vote, despite Lewinfield pointing out that the POs residing officers have the folios of everyone's photographs. These photographs that they have are those that were used and taken and put on your ID cards. So there shouldn't be a difference in the, the photograph that's on the folio and the photo in your ID card. And so what is very clear, the law allows the presiding officer that if they have a folio and you're standing in front of them, you don't have your ID card, it looks like you, you're allowed to vote. GCOM also announced at the press conference that less than a thousand persons had collected their ID cards from the 18,000 uncollected ID cards. GCOM also announces that the uh, International Republican Institute, attached to the Republican Party in the United States, will be doing the voter education and they have signed a contract with the IRI. It is still December, it's not over. We're still waiting for some public announcement of the GCOM response to the United Nations offer of an international IT specialist, which was initially made in May 2018 after the request of the then chairman, and again in October 2019. Today, the newspaper and the media has reported that the uh, GCOM, the efforts that they're making to check this house to house the list of 16 on 1,000 between now and Sunday. He also announced that they, they, they will be, the list, the revised list of electors will be ready by the end of December and that they will then be put up for scrutiny before publishing the OLE. We have to recognize too that um, GCOM still has an enormous amount of work to do in terms of the decision in regards to this house to house list. So supposedly they verify all these names or they don't verify, what are they gonna do with those persons? How are they gonna treat with them? And this is holding up, as far as I'm concerned, the preparation of the revised list of electors because certainly they have the names from the claims objection that went through a, a total uh, verification with the presence of scrutineers. In fact, my information today is that one of the registration offices of GCOM, the RO specifically told the polling, the scrutineers, that they're not involved with a verification exercise, they're involved with a confirmation exercise. Now, the electoral laws of Ghana do not provide for any confirmation, it, require, it talks about verification. So again, GCOM seems to be making up its own rules as it goes along. Well, as you know, nomination day will be January the 10th, and let's see when the revised list of electors will be published. Um, it, if it keeps to the December, end of December date that Mr. Lowenfield gave today, and that requires 21 days for it to be available for corrections. 
the publishing of the RLE is important for political parties to ensure their candidates are on the voters list before submission of that list on nomination date. So those are what's, that's the road we've traversed for the last year. A long and tedious road and we're left with 74 days coming up to March the 2nd. So March the 2nd is the 74th day and that's when our people have to go and vote and to present themselves uh, to the polling stations with ID cards, passports, or if they don't have them, to go before the presiding officer. And once the photograph looks like you, you're entitled to vote. And not a tendered ballot, a real vote. Because remember, tendered ballots are not counted. Many times tendered ballots are given to people just to make them feel satisfied they vote. But they're not counted. And therefore it's important that our people recognize that they are able to go and vote without an ID card, without a passport. But I do think that we have to keep asking ourselves, why does this 20,000 or thereabouts figure keep reoccurring? My belief is that they want 20,000 or more names removed from the voters list, as this represents approximately three to four seats in parliament, they being the APNU AFC government. You know, because one has to recognize that the difference in the votes in 2015, assuming that it was it was all done correctly, which is not, there was tampering of the 2015 election, that, and, and there must be an explanation why the election petition cannot be heard in our courts for five years, almost five years. But let's assume that it was no tampering at all. Mr. Granger only got 4,526 votes more. That's why he likes to talk about the 207,000 votes that APNU got. But he doesn't like to refer to the 2,002 plus vote, 202,000 votes that the People's Progressive Party got. Because then people do simple maths and know there's only a 4,000 plus difference between the two parties. So he avoids that studiously and talks about the 207,000 votes that he got and it shows that despite him talking about inclusivity that he has no concept of inclusivity because if he was he'd recognize that the 202,000 plus voters that voted for the PP are also important and that he's sitting on quicksand with 4,526 votes difference less than one percent less than one percent difference between the two parties and therefore he must know too that this margin that he holds on to as if he's a king and an emperor and entitled to whatever he has in office and his whole cabinet, that this can be, this can vanish, this 4,526 voters can vanish in the twinkling of an eye. And so you have to recognize that APNU AFC will try, I believe, to do everything to remove legitimate voters. That is why we have this 14 month delay to hold elections. So that firstly, they can hold on to power as long as possible and enjoy life. And secondly, they have time to reduce the number of voters on the voters list. Clearly, the, the Mr. Granger is a man who is well trained in military arts, particularly psychops. And so I believe part of the, the, the notion of Mr. Granger is that wear us out as a people we are gone January, February, March, April, May, June, July, you know, August, September, October, November, December. This is to whittle us down, to wear us out, to give up, to feel that nothing will happen, so they will give up. Well, we haven't given up. We've been, we've been struggling all the time, so much so that Mr. Granger on December 5th accused the PPP, listen to this, accused the PPP <laughs> that the major difficulty, when he was asked the question on hot seat December 5th, what are some of the difficulties that you have faced since assuming office in 2015 in getting to where you have highlighted? The majority difficulty, Mr. Granger is quoted as saying, has come from the People's Progressive Party. In the first instance, we inherited a bad hand, what you call a bad hand in dominoes. 
in terms of the sugar industry, the fiber optic cable from Lexham and Skelton factory. And then he goes on to point out. <clears throat> but these, so he points out that, that um, worse than that is the resistance we got from the regional chairman, which were elected on a PPP ticket. Regions one, two, three, five, six, and nine. This was serious because it placed a lot of emphasis on developing the regional system to give people in the areas a better life. But note, note carefully now. But those regional chairmen elected on a PPP ticket refused to cooperate with the Minister of Communities. It is almost as if the PPP was waging a civil war. And this has been a major obstacle to regional development in this country. And I think the opposition by the PEP to the APNO AFC government has been a major drawback. Clearly, this gentleman has lost his beans because if anyone knows what's been happening in the regional system with the appointment of REOs by the president, who have done nothing but to ensure that the regions controlled, one and controlled by the PVPC, do not function. But so that in, in Region 1, I pointed out in an earlier program, that there hasn't been a meeting for almost a whole year, because the ARIO will not release money for the councillors to come from the various parts of the region, and accommodation, etc., to come to RDC meetings. And now the entire region has met once for the year. Yet the region where the PNC controls, money is being released for plenty of travel for the councillors of all sides to come to the meeting. And so we've seen what happened in Region 5 with the ARIO's domination of the Region 5. The behavior of the Region 2 ARIO, for example, in particular. And so Mr. Granger seems to be living in a, another part of the world or another world completely. It is his people that he appointed that have been the greatest obstacle for development at the regional level, including withholding money, including doing procurement that is illegal and against the procurement laws of Ghana, of which the chairman and the regional councils know nothing. Money has been expended at the exclusive, in the exclusive domain of the ARIO. And so the Auditor General knows that the ARIOs are counting officers. They're responsible for the, the, the wastes, the squander manian, and the corruption in the regions. And they will answer to it after March the 2nd. GCOM timelines and framework must become a public document so that people will be properly informed and have assurance that GCOM will have no excuse for delays on the election date of March the 2nd. We want that document to be public. What are the timelines that GCOM is working with to ensure, as stated by the chairman, Madam Justice Singh, that they will be ready by February 28th and therefore there should be no impediment for elections being held on March the 2nd. Of course, we have to deal with the fact that Mr. Granger said the cabinet and himself will not resign. So that is, he's been saying that all of this year. And he's also now withholding, dissolving the National Assembly and the 10 RDCs as required, as required. And so I don't know when he intends to do that. And he cannot also pretend that it is not his thing, it's cabinet who decides that. Utter nonsense, utter nonsense. The cabinet is illegal and the president's illegal and they know it. And so we are 74 days away from the elections, 74 days. It is clear that GCOM desperately needs to have an IT specialist who understands data science and will be able to audit and check the data system the database of GCOM to ensure that there's been no interference and tampering of the database itself. But it seems that GCOM secretary is light, ways, light years behind the rest of the world in terms of employing statistical measures to improve its analysis on the data. It is appalling in the 21st century that GCOM is still is dealing, uh, not dealing with resolving its data issues. We must recall, too, that we wonder if these names are now finding, they're saying not found, Jamalto is saying not found with the database, that are these people who were registered before, but whose fingerprints were taken wrongly, incorrectly, and therefore they're smudged, and therefore 
Jumalto could not cross match those those um, registrations. So we have there are statistical tools that can be used by GCOM, and that is why it's concerning why GCOM has not accepted or responded in any positive way to the presence of an international specialist, te ICT, I, I, ICT tech uh, specialist to be present in GCOM to assist the IT department. We're happy to hear that the technical support from the Commonwealth, a former commissioner, elections commissioner from India and one from Ghana will be coming in January. We're very happy that the former ch uh, chairman of the, the former uh, CEO of the Canadian Elections Commission will be coming in January. We would have preferred it to have been sooner than later, but we hope they will come in as soon as the year turns, because we have the RLE coming out, we will have the OLE coming out, we will have nominations process, and we have to make sure that the list is carefully guarded and uh, not tampered with in any way. Well, what are we in the PP doing? Of course, we've been busy all year. You've been sometimes you felt as if you're on a yo-yo, that you're going back and forth all the time. But that we have been busy all the time. We've gone through every single process: the courts, the house to house, the checking of the list of the house to house in 370, the. ID cards, checking those, the claims and objection period, the uh, preventing the objections of over 14,000 people by APNU, by being able to prove that the people existed or that in the case of dead, we could produce a death certificate. And we're now in this phase of going to check 16 plus thousand people that cannot be found on the database from the house to house registration. So right up to Sunday, we're coming very close to Christmas, scrutinies will be out in the field. And of course, as a political party, we've been having community meetings, bottom house meetings, meeting the people, listening to them. We've been doing that all year and all year before too, but this year in particular. And so we are ready, we're full throttle, ready for elections, preparing for elections. Our election campaign has, has started in what is a, a quiet way. And that obviously in January, when we launch our election campaign, then the temperature and the speed will pick up and with a lot more public activities, including the rallies, which our people are accustomed to. Of course, our presidential candidate, Irfan Ali, has been very, very energetic, going into the regions, meeting people. He has been very busy in the interior of Guyana and along the coast. and. Um, I, I congratulate him and recognize him for all the long, long hours that he's had to endure uh, since he became elected as our, our presidential candidate. I think he's doing a good job. They've been able to reach out to hundreds of thousands of people across Guyana to assure them of what the PUP stands for. We've also listed excerpts of our, of our manifesto. Uh, which is prior to the official launch of our manifesto, the full document, and a number of the of uh, the positions we're taking are being posted on a scroll that you're seeing that uh, runs on this program every time we air, so that you can see some of the positions we stand up for to ensure that our people have a better way of life. And so we are prepared for the launching, we're prepared for nomination day, and prepared for election day and all that comes between. We are ready and very, very anxious to be able to get this, to get the elections done, that we have free and fair elections, and that the people of Ghana are able to select their, the government of their choice for the next five years. We believe too that we have to be very vigilant to ensure that the elections are free and fair. And so, as we come to the close of our program, I wish you and your families a safe and happy Christmas. Please don't drink and drive. And please don't speak, speed on the roads. Too many lives are being lost every single day, particularly in November and the period of December. The speeding I've been on the roads, I don't own a car, but when I'm in a car and I'm 
my daughter drives me or my kids drive me, there isn't a time that we're on the road that we're almost bumped into, someone almost does crazy, does something crazy on the road, the speeding, the huge trucks on the road that are speeding down the right, and the, the road. These are nine, 10 ton trucks that are going at 90 miles an hour on the roads. Um, and the other day, just the other day, we, I, the car I was in, we had, in order to avoid what the truck just cut in front of us, we had to end up on the parpet, on the grass. Otherwise, I probably wouldn't be here today with you. And so, again, I'm in Pina. I've been carrying this for five years now in this program about not drinking and driving. And I'm asking you during the election period, uh, sorry, the Christmas period, that, sorry, elections are on my mind all the time. I apologize for that. But that um, during the Christmas period, we don't want to stop you from enjoying yourselves and relaxing. It's been a rough, rough year. I, I have no doubt about that. We're all tired and we just want to get into the new year and get these elections done. But please, if you're going to drink, could you drink at home? If you do drink at a bar or someone's house, could you try to arrange if you can get a taxi home or whether you can ask a friend who's not drinking to do the driving so you're not driving under the influence of alcohol? And for speeding, please, 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 Every life is precious. Every single life is precious. And so when we're driving, people are driving crazy and speeding down the road. Please remember that you have families and other people have families. Other people have children and mothers and aunts and uncles and grandfathers and husbands, not just you. And so I'm asking you, especially at this Christmas time, because I know there are parties around and people go to enjoy themselves, Please don't drink and drive. And please low, lower the speed. Keep to the speed limit. That's that. Keep to the speed limit. And we'll all maybe be able to enjoy our Christmas and see ourselves into the new year. Um, I hope that you have a blessed week. That all goes well for your families at Christmas and Boxing Day, regardless of what religion, regardless of what part of the country we live in. We all enjoy different aspects of Christmas. Some people go to church, some people just enjoy the family gatherings and all the food. Other people just like the quiet time. And so enjoy yourselves, be safe. We will meet again on the first program that we will have in January uh, 2020, on January the 2nd. So I'll be coming immediately after the holiday of January the 1st. And so I look forward to meeting you then. And so please remember that when we, that when the elections are held on March the 2nd, 2020, we in the PEPC government shall have to start all over again in 1992 to reconstruct, to put this economy back on a firm and stable footing and to restore the programs which helped the poor and vulnerable and those at risk and restore the independence of the judiciary, the legislature from executive interference and to protect rule of law and democracy. Season's greetings to everyone. Have a wonder, wonderful ho Christmas holidays and all the best to you. And we will meet again. And of course, all the best for the new year. And we'll meet again on January 2nd, 2020. Bye-bye, ta-ta. The views expressed on this program are not necessarily those of CNS Channel We need your support more than ever this season. Thousands of lives are on the line. So please call this toll-free number or visit joinaspca.org with your $19 monthly gift now. We need 3,000 new donors in the next 30 days so we can rescue more animals this winter.
They're fighting to stay alive. Please find it in your heart this holiday season to help them. Go online or call now and join our fight to rescue these innocent animals from cruelty. And because the situation is so urgent, we're asking you to join in the next 10 minutes. And if you